Hello everyone, this is Bentley from Kent, Washington, and today, if you don't happen to know this guy, I have been joined by Randy Reed. Uh, if you somehow don't know Randy, he is the host of Aquarius Podcast, the director of operations at Aquarium Co-op. He is also, which you probably don't know, the CARES chairperson for the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society, and I am lucky enough to call him my friend. Randy, thank you for joining us today, man. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, I'm sure people probably don't know who I am, so I don't think that's really that big of a surprise. But, oh, come uh, on. Glad, glad come on. You had, like, the most epic intro video of any person who's an employee at a fish store known to man. <laughs> that's because that's the only one so far, but there will be more. Yeah, Murphy's kind of got an intro or two. <laughs> Mur Murphy's Jimmy's like an employee. Jimmy works magic. Let's just say that. Jimmy does work magic. Jimmy does work magic. So, uh, aside from your... I guess you'd say you would normally in the Aquarius podcast go and ask for someone to give their their like short story of how they got into fish. We've talked about that when you interviewed me because um, we have very similar stories. So I want to skip what got you originally into fish. And I want to ask what brought you back to fish? And more importantly, what keeps you in this hobby, pursuing it now as a career on top of a hobby? All right, so what got me back into the hobby, it was, it, I mean, it's pretty much only been a year now since I actually got back into the hobby, um, which is which is kind of crazy, and actually maybe we're coming up on a full year, but um, it was one, you know, one evening my wife and I were out uh, in Kirkland, Washington, and uh, one of the local pet stores, Denny's Pet World, which is a, a fantastic local mom and pop shop, um, which maybe saying mom and pop doesn't do them justice, but they're a really, really good local shop. We had just gone in there, and sometimes we'd go in there just to kill time or just wander around and look at stuff. And we had a rabbit at the time, so sometimes we were just buying rabbit food. Um, but seeing their, like, fluval edges and specs and, you know, the various uh, small nano tanks, and they'd always have them scaped really nice. It's like, man, that looks really, really cool. Like, I think I could dip my toe back in and, you know, just get one tank and, and just do a beta. And I think, I think we'd be good. Like, that seems like something really cool. And my son, who I think was one at the time, like, it'd be really cool to see him light up at having a fish in the house. Because um, we've got dogs, we've got the chickens, and we had the – well, actually, no, the rabbit passed away before he was born. So I uh, didn't have the rabbit at the time. But nonetheless, it'd be really cool to have the fish in the house and see his reaction. And so my wife, you know, I, I wanted to make sure it was okay with her um, because she knows last time I had numerous, numerous tanks and, you know, that whole thing. Um, and she was cool permission from the boss. Yeah, per permission from the boss, which was a huge mistake on her part, because obviously it spiraled into <laughs> something more than just having a flu ball spec three um, in your kitchen. So, so yeah, we got the uh, we got that one tank, and from there it was just um, kind of a snowball of of getting into YouTube and uh, watching all those videos. Whether it's actually I wasn't watching too much DIY, but just random YouTube videos here and there on on fish keeping and. Um, that multiple tank syndrome just really popped back up. Like it was something that lay dormant in me for a decade and it just reared its ugly head and well, beautifully ugly head and uh, took a hold of my life. So here we are. Sweet. So um, I, I, I know tons of stuff just because we've had lots of conversations on the side. But um, what I guess to me is most interesting is that you've made this huge shift from – taking your career path at Amazon, a massive company. And when you're in the Seattle area, like the tech firms really are the companies you kind of shoot toward to something that is a small business in the grand scheme of things. Now, is that, is your, has your love in just a year for the hobby grown that much? Or is it more the opportunity to push something that is a hobby out a little more, by kind of rescaping the landscape that is how we perceive either online or brick and mortar fish stores. Yeah. So I would say just for a little clarification, I had actually left Amazon prior to joining aquarium co-op. So um, I did two years at Amazon working at a corporate in Seattle. Um, South Lake union is where the, most of the corporate offices are located for Amazon. And I went there and I did two years, which if anybody that's worked at Amazon knows that two years at Amazon is about a decade anywhere else. Um, and so I went there and, you know, I succeeded, I got promoted and made a lot of wonderful friends. And I just stepped back and said, all right, I need, I need to get some work-life balance. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of great things about working at Amazon, but, you know, the commute in from where I live into Seattle is, you know, at least an hour one way and an hour back. 
uh, depending on traffic. And, you know, we've got a, a second kid on the way now. And I just knew that it was something that I needed to do for myself, my family, just get a little bit more work-life balance. So then I actually left uh, the e-commerce tech side of things with Amazon, and I went to um, a biotech company. And it was at that time, after a couple months of being there, um, which was basically down the road from my house, that, uh, you know, Corey approached me and, you know, he and I had some off and on conversations. I obviously interviewed him for the Aquarius podcast. Um, and so, you know, there was there was some, uh, you know, loose communication, if you will, between us. And I always thought that if I ever interacted with him, it'd be on kind of a consulting basis. Like, hey, here's some things that I that I know that may be able to help you out. Hook me up with a hoodie. Right. Like I'm not really looking for any monetary gain here. Uh, maybe you give me a discount on some plants, something of that, something of that extent, right? Like I'm just such a big fan of Aquarium Co-op and the videos and the knowledge that I've already learned from them. Um, I felt like it would be cool for me to be able to give back to them in that capacity. Uh, and then when we actually had our conversation, it was, you know, no, I, I think I've got an, a position for you to come on full time. Um, and we talked about it some more. And, you know, for me, being at Amazon, being at this biotech company, I was doing my job and, you know, I'm somebody that is a pretty hard worker and, um, you know, I, I don't like to, um, you know, feel like I'm, I'm not putting in my eight or nine or 10 hours, whatever it need, needs to happen to get the job done. But, you know, you, you pop off and you look at your hobby websites, right? Like if you're going to pull up something to do competitor research or whatnot, sometimes you'll get distracted and you go to, you know, one of your, um, I don't know, you go to whatever resource online there is for your hobby or your interest, and you spend maybe five minutes looking at that, and then you go back to your normal work, right? Like when you've got access to a, to a computer at work, we all do it, right? You walk by your coworkers' desks, and you see that they're looking at something on Amazon.com. Although when I was at Amazon, that was very tricky because everybody's looking at Amazon.com, and you don't know if somebody's shopping or actually working. Um, <laughs> so it, it was just an opportunity to, you know – I, I love looking up stuff. I love looking at fish. I love going to Aquabid and all these other places. Like, why not just take this leap of faith and, and see if I can make a career of it? And, you know, here I am. I, I almost wonder if your interview with uh, Sean Hale slightly influenced you. Oh, into, oh, into making <laughs> Like making that leap. <laughs> Which, like every, for, know, for those of you who haven't watched, I, I have to go down this. I would normally, like, ask for a... Uh, what I call a 60 second sell. I used to work in the marketing world and that's how we refer to you, like your elevator speech for those of you who are used to the interviewing world. Um, but if you haven't watched Aquarius podcast, I'm just going to go over some of the most recent interviews you've had. I'm going to ignore it. Watch or listen. Eh, I live in the <laughs> YouTube sphere, so I sort of watch. I, I mean, truly it's listening because they are pure audio interviews, but, uh, but let's let's go down the list as far as I'm concerned is just insane. So you've had Sean Hale from Fritz Aquatics, right? Rosario Lacort. Never heard of him. I'm going to say this again. Rosario <laughs> Lacort. But you don't know who Rosario Lacort is. You're live new. and in person. You're new. And yeah, it was live. Live. Um, you've, you've had the... You know, I'll go. I'll start doing businesses that people might know from, say, Facebook or something like Pico Paradise. Um, who else can we go down? <laughs> uh, to, then you've got some of my favorite interviews, like uh, Joe Frenesi, who's just fantastic. I can listen to that guy all day long. Yeah. So, so to, to jump in real quick, Joe um, is a legend in his own right. So, if you haven't read Rosario's book, he's got a. Um, you know, there's maybe six or seven people that Rosario actually mentions by name and has a little. Um, you know, half page or full page um, excerpt about them. Joe Ferdinzi is one of them. And Joe's a legend in his own right, right? Like, let's, I, I, I really feel like people need to understand that about Joe. Like, he's actually honored by, I think it's the Greater City Aquarium Society. There's actually like a Joe Ferdinzi Award for that club. And so. All right, like, that I did not know. Yeah, like, so like going to Joe's house and having dinner with him and his wife and touring his fish room and having a live interview with him, um, and then having Joe be the person that introduces me to Gary Bagnell, the president of ZooMed, um, Rosario LaCourt, and basically knowing that anytime I go to New York, I have an open invitation to go to Joe Ferdinzi's house, who, again, is, is somebody in, that is a legend in his own right. That, that seems pretty nice. <laughs> seems pretty nice. Um, so let's, let's move to what I really want to talk about. We've kind of introduced you and what you do. You recently have been building a fish room. And this might be left field as far as what most people would consider what to ask you about, given what you do and your your experience. But 
we've we've had a few conversations. Um, I've seen the work in progress. I haven't seen the finished product because I think you're you're close, but you're not quite there yet, right? It's it's kind of it's kind of there now. There's like two things that need to be done, but it's pretty much a functioning fish room. That's things that point. need to be done. That means it's not done. <laughs> well, is <it's, it's> a <laughs> fish room ever done though? Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> but um, I I would re- I really want to go. There's tons of videos out there about how to set up a fish room, or this is how I set up my fish room. But we had a conversation not long ago where we discussed how there's a lack of information about some of the pitfalls in setting up a fish room and kind of the educational side that can prevent people from running into those problems. And that's really what I want to focus on today. Yeah. Step one is don't set up a fish room. (laughs) That's, that's enjoy somebody else's fish room. I don't don't know. Some of us, some of us would be real happy to have a full out fish room as opposed to stuff scattered all over the house. (laughs) this guy well your your plans man your plans sound pretty uh pretty awesome yeah my plans are my plans are a level of insanity that most people should probably not walk down but (laughs) i can't wait till you do (laughs) one of those uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna gonna consult notes so when i look over here folks it's it's because i have notes i tried to be vaguely prepared this time i love that i can just sit here and let questions roll to me yeah it's it's nice isn't it you don't have to like think them up or 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 feel like you need to steer the conversation you can just laugh as i struggle yeah i really don't even drink beer but this feels like i just need to be sitting back drinking a beer and letting you do your thing (laughs) so (laughs) this is uh, fun being interviewed beyond beyond the obvious of like Every fish nerd kind of wants to be able to say they have their own fish room. Um, why did you choose to build a fish room? Is it you want to focus more on some breeding? Is it I just want to make things easier because I can use things like automatic water change? I can heat a room instead of heating individual tanks. Uh, you know, what what drove you to build a fish room? Yeah, so it's, you know, you, you can only amass so many tanks and have them scattered around the house before you realize that you know, changing out faucet adapters so your python would work, you know, in in one bathroom and then have to change it to another bathroom. Um, There's a certain economies of scale that when you're able to concentrate all your tanks in one area that you can maximize that, right? You only have to hook up the python once and do your water changes. Um, So, you know, starting with that spec three again, um, so that was tank number one. Um, and then let's see what, what was tank number two? Tank number two was going to be now this, this, I really had to like beg and plead with the wife. Like, okay, okay. I know I said it was only going to be this one little bit of tank, but all right. So Petco has got this sale. I can get a 75 gallon. I can build the stand myself. It'll be super cheap and we'll just put it in the spare room that we never use. It'll be fine. And that'll be it. I promise. I actually said, I promise. Like, I think she made me say that. I promise that I wouldn't want any more from there. Whoops. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so as, I, as I'm as I'm building the stand and as I'm watching more and more YouTube videos, it's like, oh, my God, there's more and more stuff that I want to do. And so then I thought about just ditching the 75 gallon using the stand that I had and put, you know, um, end on end uh, 10 gallons on the top. And then I was going to have a cabinet underneath for a sump. I'm like, well, I could put like two tanks in there so then I can have six tanks instead of the one big one. And she's like, no, you need to just do the one big nice tank like you said, like you sold me on. All right. So I went ahead and did that. And so I set that tank up. And then I think she went back home with my son to visit her family. And then I went ahead and built a 40-gallon stand, like, while she was gone. And then set up a 40-gallon tank. And so, <laughs> and so it just, yeah, it's, it's just me being a, uh, yeah, just being a, a devious, uh, deviant husband of uh, kind of going back on my word and just saying, you know, this is my thing. I'm going to get back into keeping fish. Um, and so, so, again, I'm saying all this because I'm now starting to concentrate tanks in our spare bedroom which again fully carpeted um you know kind of an overflow guest bedroom that we really only use once a year when you know two sets of in-laws uh, or two sets of grandparents come to visit uh so i felt like we were okay um and then you know after watching more and more youtube videos and fully immersing myself and then joining the uh um, gsas a greater seattle aquarium society that we're both members of i'm like all right i'm gonna set up a rack I'm going to set up a rack. I'm going to do 10 gallons. And I think at this point, I'm like, I'm going to do rainbow fish, right? So it's something small. It's something that, you know, is relatively easy to breed, not necessarily easy to raise, but relatively easy to breed. Um, And that'll be my thing. So then I put in this Gladiator 60-inch rack in here, and it's a fantastic rack. But now I've completely ruined this, you know, spare bedroom that we have. 
and my wife is upset, and I'm like, I don't care. This is gonna be my thing. You can have every other room in the house. You can put whatever you want on the walls. Like that's gonna be my room. Um, and then I had it always in the back of my mind, like, man, I probably should have just built something out in the garage or move these tanks out there. Um, and then it just came down to, you know, my wife saying, I'm really sad that you ruined that bedroom. What can you do? I'm like, well, I can build out that room in the garage. And she says, good, go ahead and do it. <laughs> yeah, get all your so, stuff out of the garage. Go get out of the house. Yeah, yeah pretty much. No, I mean, in this, room, <laughs> in this room. So the room that actually my recording studio for the podcast is the spare bedroom, um, is the room that I'm in right now. And to my right over here, that way, um, it, the remaining 75 gallon is still there and the 40 gallon, the 40 gallon is Poe, my Shodentai puffers tank. The 75 gallon is the big, you know, massive planted uh, rainbow fish community tank. And then the plan for that is to consolidate those two into one. Maybe not so much have, I don't know, maybe, maybe have the Shodentai with the rainbows. We'll see how that works out. Um, but actually move them into the downstairs living room and get like a 125 gallon acrylic tank. I've been talking with Jason from Clear Fabrications that I interviewed, and um, I think you know in the coming months that will be the that will be the the next move will be to consolidate these two tanks, fully give this room back, and then move a nice community planted tank where it can be appreciated in a family room, and then this room will fully be back to my wife. So sweet. So now we know why. <laughs> I wonder if I'm a terrible interview yet. No, 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 no. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Um, it's it's always the interviewer's fault. <laughs> That's the rule. That was the rule back in radio. Um, so you, you've got this plan to build your fish room now because mostly from the you, let's let's appease the boss, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and also it makes things easier, as you've mentioned. Like it, well, cha- yeah, changing I mean, water between multiple rooms is never easy, um, and there's all sorts of things you can do. So I mean, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Like. Building out a fish room, it's like, yes, it's going to make things much easier for me, but it's going to be awesome because I can get even more tanks. So it's not like right. it's just making my wife happy. Like, this is a win-win for both of us. Right. Yeah, you have a you have a space where it's basically, yes, you can have as much as you can fit in this room. Well, I'm going to fit a lot in that room. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to fit a try. lot in that room. <laughs> um, so you you start your building process, your, your planning process. Which kind of features mattered the most to you? Is it spe- Were you targeting specific tank sizes, uh, automatic water change? You know, what, what kind of things were on the top of your list? This is what I have to have in the fish room. Oh, without a doubt, auto water change. So a drilled, drilled tanks with an overflow and auto water change. Absolutely. With a, you know, with a growing family, second kid on the way, um, you know, working, I think, was I building this while I was at Amazon? I think so. Um, with, with having a pretty strenuous, you know, professional career, knowing that to really, um, you know, enable me to do the things that I wanted to do from an Aquarius perspective, I needed to have the auto water change system or else I, I just wouldn't have the time to do the water changes like I would need to do, um, in order to breed fish and, you know, grow out fry and, and, and do it in a relatively, you know, in a compressed time window, right? Like heavy feeding and all that fun stuff. Like you need to do a lot of water changes and, and things like that. So. Okay, now, still in the planning, were there any uh, research resources that you really used as either a blueprint or this is what I don't want to do? Well, um, I, I thought what I wanted to do was actually go cinder blocks. I thought I was going to do it really on the cheap, do cinder blocks and two by fours um, and just maximize the space that way, knowing that I would still be um, leaving space out there inherently by doing the cinder block plan. And so I thought that I thought that's what I was going to do. And I don't know. I, it had to have been at a club meeting that I was talking with Dean. Uh, so Master Breeder Dean. So like 50 years of experience also has been on the Aquarius podcast. So super cool guy. I actually saw him today at the co-op. Um, he's he's so in I, there more often than he wants to admit. Yeah, he's probably going to be in there more often than I'll ever be in there. Um, he's breeding a lot of fish, though. He's got to bring him in and, you know, let us sell him. Uh, so you're talking with him. He's like, no, no, no. You gotta, you gotta go racks, Randy. And it's, you know, I'm kind of stubborn in my ways, and a lot of times when people give me their advice like that, it's like, yeah, all right, thanks for the advice, but I'm still gonna do my own thing. And you know, it, it really made me kind of sit back and think, like, mm, we got one shot at this. It's already kind of a small space, so it's about 10 by 13 feet that I built out in the garage. Um, so it's by no means a large, large space. And given that it's not a large space, like I really don't have 
the the room to to sacrifice to cinder to the extra length or the extra width that cinder blocks are going to take up. Um, so you know, no, I, I I think I should go racks. I think I need to bite the bullet, just invest a little bit more, and actually get the racks because you know one rack is going to be more expensive than you know the entire cinder block in two by fours put yeah. together, probably three times over. Um, so you know, because I knew that. Once I got it set up, there's always going to be that itching like, oh, man, if I only have gotten, you know, five more tanks in here that I could have started breeding this species or, you know, I could breed this a little bit more and have even more fry at, a, at you know, a couple weeks spaced out and, and be able to deliver on a, on a more of a cadence. Um, so that was also one of the one of the thoughts at the time was I wanted to have a consistent supply of one type of fish to my local fish store, master that fish, supply them with that fish on a consistent basis. Um, you know, not an overwhelming amount. Like I'm not going to come in and drop 200 on you, but you know, whatever, whatever your weekly amount is that you can sell, like that's what I want to be able to bring you on a consistent basis. Um, and so that's kind of how I wanted to plan my fish room out. And after talking with him, realizing that I need to do racks and I need to maximize and get as many tanks in there as I can to make that happen. Hey, are you, are you still, now this is kind of aside. Are you still looking at doing a rainbow fish? Is that one fish you want to provide? Um, not anymore. <laughs> No, they're too freaking hard, man. You learned your lessons. <laughs> I mean, they're 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 great. The uh, so I was gonna go with the um, Pseudomogo luminatus, so the red neon rainbow, absolutely beautiful fish. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, breeding rainbows is not hard. It's the raising of them. And actually, yeah. with this particular fish, so up until that point, I'd already had success with getting um, Bosmani, uh, Praycox, and uh, Chilorthina fasciata. The ungs, as I like to call them. The ungulums. Yeah. The ungulums, there you go. Uh, straight, those were actually from Gary Lang as well. So I, I was able, I had success you know, getting those to, to breed, to raising up the fry. But something about these pseudomogils, um, one, they're egg eaters. So the other ones, the chilathenas and the, um, the, the melatonea are not egg eaters. So you can leave a mop in there and let it collect for a week, then pull it out or, or whatever the duration is. Pseudomogils, you have to go in there every single day and pull eggs. Um, and you know, they're not laying a ton of eggs, uh, to begin with. So that, that's kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I was finding is I would go in every day and I think I had, let's, let's just say three trios. Uh, I, I think that's somewhere in, in the ballpark range. So three trios of these guys and gals, and I'm going in there and I'm maybe getting, I don't know, let's just call it 10 eggs a day. And by pretty much day two or three of these eggs, and I had a whole system. I was, you know, writing on it with liquid chalk on the um, on the tank, how many eggs, the dates, and I had it all planned out. I was going to record everything and be dialed in, and I'm starting to get eggs fungus. Mm -hmm. I had never had that happen with the melatonin or the chilathena, so I had no idea what the heck's going on. And this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I actually reached out to Gary Lang. He's like, well, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Are you doing that? I'm like, well, I, I, I think so. Short of feeding baby Brian, that was the one thing that he had said that I wasn't doing, but... I was trying um, straight water, not dechlorinated um, water that was dechlorinated, water with hydrogen peroxide, water with methylene blue. And to this date, the only, I've only gotten, I think, six, and they're currently growing out right now. Once they're, once they're grown out enough, I'm going to take them to Robert into the co-op. But all of that effort, I was only able to, able to get six. And it's not that I want to hang my hat up. But it's knowing that I have a second kid on the way, knowing that I have a full career, knowing that, you know, all of these things and sure, they're excuses, but it's just, you know, I, I want to be successful in my fish room. And I know that I need to have fish that um, I can step away from for a day and mm -hmm. have things be on cruise control and have it be all right, knowing that the water changes are going to get done, knowing that they're going to get fed. But it's just that extra step of going in and pulling eggs out of a mop every single day. Like that's that's straight up work. And that's unfortunately at this time in my life. Maybe, maybe in the future I'll go back and revisit it. Like there's things like uh, talking to Adam Till when I interviewed him on the podcast about having a tank of cherry shrimp, dropping the eggs in the tank of cherry of the cherry shrimp, and seeing if they're able to actually eat the fungus off of the eggs um, and preventing it from spreading, or eating the fungus eggs and keeping it from spreading from the healthy ones. He said that was one of the tricks that he had done with goldfish. So I'm like, oh, maybe that's something I could try with these guys. Maybe that would help me out. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, trying all these different things and not getting the results. It's, it's just, I'm like, you know, again, I'm just at this point in my life where I, I can't invest that kind of time um, to go through it. So, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but at the same time, I, I think it's worth, like, looking at something and knowing, like, maybe it's not the right time. Try again another time or look at some other options. Take a step back. Don't force yourself too hard because it can only lead to frustration and it can be 
so much worse, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we've got some ideas of like why you want the fish room, what you want to do in the fish room. Now we're building it. And, and here's where I think the important part is. We can, we can watch videos all day long that tell us this is how much my fish room costs, or this is, this is how you put together an automatic water change system. But they don't necessarily tell you some of the pitfalls, no matter how many of those tutorials are out there in doing this work. Um, so first off, let's, let's start with kind of the basics. You mentioned that this is only about a 10 by 13 space. So we're talking in the grand scheme of things, kind of a small space. Aside from um, that changing out, you taking that extra investment, going to racks instead of the, the cheap center block and two by four build out. Are there any other challenges that having that small space forced on you? Um, so wanting to get a sink in there. So I knew that was really important. Uh, wanting to have like a workspace sink area. Unfortunately, I went to, well, so, I, you know, using, using Excel, using, you know, other planning tools, looking up Aquion at tank dimensions and whatnot, and trying to figure out, you know, how many tanks you can fit in a rack. One, you know, one newbie mistake is when Gladiator or Husky say that they have a 60 inch or a 77 inch rack, um, it is not that full width that you're going to get. You're actually going to get about five inches less than that because they're actually counting the full width as opposed to the usable width. So when you think you're going to get three 30, three 40 gallon breeders on one shelf and all of a sudden you only get two and you're like, oh my God, this third one isn't fitting. Man, yeah, because you've got the, the support poles that are exactly. taking away space from you. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that's something that, and again, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that, you know, unfortunately measure, measure once, cut once. Uh, maybe maybe measure 1.5 times, cut once, kind of, or cut three times. Actually, uh, it, it's just how my brain's wired. Like we all have our strengths, and I'm not I'm not an engineer. Uh, you're not going to hire me to do a carpentry project. That's just not what you do. You hire me to do other stuff, not that. Um, so you know, and, you know, when you think you have it planned out, how many tanks are going to fit on a certain rack? Things don't end up working out. So to maximize my space, you know, on when I when I put in a 77 inch rack on the south wall. All of a sudden, I can't get as many tanks on as I thought. I now have to go to a 90-inch rack on the north wall and sacrifice shelf space and also sacrifice space to get into my uh, to my sink. So you have to be, you know, you have to be fairly slim to scoot by my two tank or my two racks and get to my sink. So um, good news, you're you know, a slim guy. Yeah, I mean, you, well, you'll, for now, I keep eating too many dang ramen meals and whatnot. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Yeah, so, you know, that that's something that, I, I mean, sure, maybe if I had a better CAD program or, if, you know, I knew that coming into it, well, actually, if I knew that coming into it, that you lose out on that on that, that width because of those support beams. Um, so anybody planning a fish room, maybe you know this, maybe you don't. Take your, you know, learn from me on my mistake that you have to take those support poles into consideration and the advertised width is not actually the, the width that you're going to get. Um, and that, you know, that makes a huge Huge deal. I mean, it was literally like a quarter of an inch. A quarter of an inch prevented me from having three 40 breeders on a 77. That is that is the most frustrating quarter inch of your life, I bet. Yeah, it was it was, it was pretty bad. It was really really bad. Um, yeah. So, let's see, what was the question? What else? What else popped up that I didn't expect? So, just like other things, just regarding to the space. I mean, this is a pretty good. I, I think that's a huge lesson. There is just when you're planning out these things, make sure that the the size of the rack does not necessarily equal the usable space for tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, even if you're designing them, you have to account for the room of your support poles. You, you might even need to account for how much room you need toward the back of the tank. And if that rack is designed to perfectly hold the footprint of the tank, you have to have mm -hmm. that rack pushed out. If you're using a hang on back or any kind of piping, these are important things in your planning stage. And unfortunately in your case it kind of bitchy in the rear a little yeah yeah and the moment you you know when you when you start framing out a space or at least you know when you clear out the space in my case the garage and you start putting down chalk lines and you're like man this is this is actually a pretty good sized room and you frame it out and you're still looking at it like yeah this is a pretty nice space but once you start putting in 24 inch wide racks on four walls or actually in my case three walls the well it wasn't gonna be the west wall actually has a 210 gallon tank um, so that's kind of one oddity in there. So yeah, there's that there's that big massive tank in there, and that that's purely just for like I want one species to go ape shit crate. Ape poop. You're gonna have to beat that out. <clears throat> I don't know how that works out. 
I I'm not monetized. It's fine. I just want one species to go crazy in that tank and do their thing, and so that's what that is. Um, if I if I pull if I pull eggs um, from whatever I keep in there or fry or whatever it is into grow out a tank, so be it. But I just want one big like whoa kind of tank, and I had the opportunity um, to buy one through our through our club as a resource. Um, one just happened to come available, and I was the only one that wanted it, so it just worked out really really well to get a 210 gallon for like dirt cheap, basically free. Like I think gas to go get it was more than actually buying it. Um, Seem, seems like a really good deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it was hard to be hard, hard to pass up. Um, yeah, so I mean, just you know, what are, we, what are we talking about? Planning it and trying to take as many things into consideration. And yeah, seeing the space shrink once you actually put these racks in, and you know, going into Dean's fish room and like, man, this thing is actually really tight. Mine's gonna be bigger. And it's like, nope, it's like the same <laughs> like tight space. We've got the same dimensions, um, and it's just trying to maximize it as much as possible. I would say one lesson learned is, you know, if you are going to build a fish room, just buy a freaking house with a basement. Like, just move. Move somewhere that has a house with basements, and then you're set. I wish. I wish. Uh, yeah. yeah, so many of the – especially in our area, so many of the houses that are built, more, if, they weren't, if they weren't built in the 50s and 60s, they don't have basements anymore. Yeah. Uh, I mean, where, I, where I grew up in California, I mean, both northern and southern California, there's no basements. I yeah. think uh, I, maybe one house I'd been into had a basement, and that was just – Super, super rare to find. And then you go to the Midwest and everything has a basement. Everything. Well, they also get nasty tornadoes too, right? So you need them. You need them. Uh, so, all right. We've had, we know that you wanted automatic water change. So you had to drill tanks and set up that system. Mm -hmm. What challenges and pitfalls did you run into? You know, um, did you, did you have the typical issue that a lot of people do where you blew out a couple of tanks or, were you lucky enough to get that lesson from Dean on how not to? No, uh, no, I, I was I was a stupid, cocky young person that's like, ha ha, you may break tanks, so I'm not going to break tanks. I think I'm up to six, I think I've broken six 10-gallon tanks. <laughs> yep. When you, break, when you break one and it's, you know, dollar a gallon, you're like, bah, $10, no big deal. When you break two, you're like, mm, all right, now it's starting to suck. But when you break six, you're like, this is just getting frustrating. And, and, and now it's to the point where I paint, I paint three sides. I paint, um, you know, back, back in the, the two sides and mm -hmm. I was painting the bottom, but then I realized, oh wait, I put them on a black, black painted, uh, plywood anyway. So I don't need to do the bottom anymore. Um, uh, but there's a lot of time. Like there's just a lot of like painting, drying, flip over, repeat. And so it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a two day thing. Although now I've cut it down. I use, uh, the Rust-Oleum enamel paint. And I just cake it on. I cake it on in one coat. I don't screw around. I just I'm not touching that side again. I'm I'm at that point <laughs> with this fish room. And keep in mind, like the reason why like time is so precious to me, um, you know, just again to pry a little bit into my into my personal life. Uh, I work Monday through Friday, and my wife works Saturday and Sunday. So I have my son all day on Saturday and Sunday. So that is not like I'm not doing house projects. I don't. It's not Randy gets to go work in his fish room all day on the weekend. Like I've got my, my two year old son who I love and we do fun stuff, but you know, who's, who's absolutely adorable by the way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's a, he's a real goofball, but um, so time is incredibly, incredibly important to me. Like that's why again, the auto water change is super crucial. Like with our, our, our comp, you know, how, how our lives are right now. Like I, I need to maximize my time as much as possible. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I'm going to write a letter to Aquilon and ask them if they can just make thicker, like, please charge me an extra 10 cents for every 10 gallon tank. If you use 20 gallon thickness glass, like, do you really have to use the thinnest possible glass for a 10 gallon tank? Can you it's, make it just a little thicker? Well, the problem is it's not always the thickness of the glass. It's whether or not the glass has been tempered and it's no, no. Oh no, no. This is not temp. No, I'm not. Breaking, okay. I'm so not, you're, no, I'm not you're breaking not tanks. No, I'm, I'm not breaking tanks because they're tempered. No, I'm breaking them because they're, they're cracking uh, on the stress of the drill. And come to find out, like these drill bits, these diamond-coated drill bits to drill into the glass, you should be changing them out every like five or six tanks. Um, but that's really only crucial for the 10-gallon because they're so thin. I feel like on a 20-gallon, you're almost – maybe an exaggeration, but it's almost twice as thick as a 10-gallon. Um, and it's just night and day difference. Like I can go through a 20-gallon – with a super old bit that I've used on 10 tanks and not crack it and not have an issue with it. Um, I also, I also cracked a 10 gallon that, um, this was, this is one that I had, you know, uh, for mealworms. What, what the heck was it for? For the chickens. I was, I was raising mealworms and I had this off brand or maybe the PetSmart version. So it wasn't an Aquion. 
and I'm like, all right, you know, I'm down. I'm, you know, I've broken five, ten gallons at this point. I'm just going to go ahead and use this thing that I already drilled, um, and I didn't crack it. So I put my bulkhead together. I, I glue that in with PVC cement. I, you know, run my line down that's going to go to the, uh, the overflow drain system that I have set up, and it's on the top rack, and I go to move it. And that back little bit that's sticking out from behind the tank, the you know the overflow tubing um, elbow basically, hits a brass fitting that I have coming out of the wall, and that was enough force to then crack. So here I that that's tank number six that I broke. I'm like, oh, God, come on, like no, I I drilled it, I put the bulkhead in, I had a PVC cemented, it was ready to be installed, and then I freaking cracked it. And so right now. When you ask me if the fish room's done, I've got 120 that needs to be put in that's already drilled, and I've got um, one more 10 in my shed right now that's already dried. It's been dry for weeks. Um, that needs to be drilled. I've already got another 10 that's been drilled, so uh, I just need to order some more bulkheads and get those installed. But we're basically waiting on three tanks, and then I can officially say that as far as from a tank perspective, the fish room is, is fully operational. All right, so don't do ten gallon drilled tanks. Is yeah, is so my the, lesson there? Yeah, <laughs> do so, do twenties so, and higher. On this on this sixty on the last rack that I put together on the mid level, um, they are three. It's going to be three twenty highs end to end, just because I did not want to take the chance. Damn it! I'll just I'll just spend twenty bucks per tank right now. It's going to be a little bit more awkward to get my hand into. Sure, it comes out a little bit farther. But I'm not um, cracking anything. I'm not going to crack it. I don't, I don't care. I don't care if it sticks out. Don't care. Like, that's how fed up I am at this point with this fish room that I'm just like, I wanted to just breed fish. Like, I just want to feed fish and do <laughs> auto water changes and be done. So, uh, perfect segue. Uh, auto water changes. I know. I know because of our previous conversation. You ran into a problem with your auto water change system where you got some advice that I don't think is very prevalent because a lot of people rely on the tape between their PVC fittings. Oh yeah, so I mean, and just, and you you had a very interesting experience that says don't. Yeah, I just mean, well, don't. For starters, I mean I'm not you know again I'm not a plumber. I'm not uh, I'm not a landscaper. I don't use PVC all the time. So some people out there may be like, well you know after we get into it more, well no duh, Randy, that's that's why you have leaks because you didn't do this and that. Hey. I, that's not my thing. Like, that's not my skill set. That's not what my degree's in. Like, I'm not, you know, professional PVC man. So some of these things I had to learn through trial and error. Um, and it's, you know, when it came to uh, threaded, threaded PVC, don't do threaded PVC. Avoid it like the plague. Try to get slip fitting as much as possible so you're using solvent. Um, you know, people online, when they put these systems together, they show that they just use tape and they end up being successful, right? But what I found, um, and from the research that I've done on actual plumbing forums is that PVC, according to these people on these forums, who say they're experts, so it's kind of like secondhand information, right? Like, who knows how good it's going to be, but it has played out for what I've experienced. When you do the Teflon tape on PVC thread um, and you thread together two PVC connections, if you back off it all slightly, you lose, like, the integrity that that Teflon tape was going to give you. I don't know if that makes sense to people out there, but basically what I experienced is multiple leaks in my manifold system for my auto water change um, at those joints. Because at one point or another, as I'm putting this four zone system together, you know, one of the one of the manifolds may have twisted back on itself a little bit. And then that one particular PVC uh, threaded joint then ended up having a compromised Teflon tape. And I did the six or seven or eight or nine or ten wraps, whatever they asked for. Um, and so I, I completely had to disassemble that entire manifold and, um, use what's called pipe dope. And so it's like a non hardening paste putty kind of thing. Uh, that seems to have solved that problem. Uh, but then having to use various types of, of threaded or slip connections from like the gardening section mixed in with like plumbing PVC, I end up having leaks. So basically my manifold is like the movie U571 when they actually take that old World War II sub to depth. And the freaking thing is just popping leaks everywhere. Like that's and that that's what happened to my manifold. Um, and so when you know you'll, you'll come to the fish room, you'll do a fish room tour. I'll show it to you. It's not you know it's not something I'm proud of, but it works. Um, I've actually taken two part epoxy, like some of the strongest stuff that you can get. You have to you know mix it set mix it. They come separate. You mix them together. And I have slathered every single joint, every single nook and cranny. I even did the thing where you know some of the advice is well you need pressure regulators if you're going to do this and this. And so. Um, a couple of the pressure regulator regulators are actually bleeding out of the weep hole 
well, screw this. So I, will, I go ahead and hit the epoxy over that weeple, and it's fine. So far, no, nothing – I've done, I don't know, 20 or 30 runs of, of this auto water change system since it's been in place. Um, none of the, the water emitters have fallen out. Maybe if you use the kind that actually do a, like a, 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 a more um, – yeah, a, a smaller drip, the mm -hmm. ones that you would use at the end of the line, the ones I'm using, you actually drill and tap or you tap and drill into the PVC. I think maybe those ones are a little bit more secure. I haven't had any issues with those. Um, you know, nothing's been, nothing's exploded out or nothing's leaked from that perspective. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I just don't think that there's enough pressure to, to necessitate having those on there. Um, so if I were to do it again, and nobody's made a video about this, but maybe somebody should, at Home Depot or your big box store, if they sell, I believe it's Rainbird that makes it, but they actually make a manifold system ready to roll. And it's what we use at the co-op. Um, I don't see any pressure regulators on the ones we have at the co-op. I don't see any back pressure check valves like you see in some videos. Um, it, it's just manifold to, you know, to the timer system, right? You've got your electronic timer system straight to those little emitters down to tubing into tanks. And so I would say look into the Rainbird manifold system where it's already built together. You basically just screw it together. Super simple. You don't have to, you know, rig it together on your own with various pieces of, you know, that kind of PVC, that kind of PVC. Um, and it, it, it's like infinite combination. You can put as many on there as you want. Um, the one, the reason I didn't go with that is it said that it's for a cold water application only. But apparently in the context of why they label it that way, is that if you if you start pushing like 100 degree water or above, you'll start to have problems with that kind of system. But for the temperature that we run for a fish room, you're never going to experience a problem. So that's, just, that's a little hot for tropical fish. Yeah, a little, a little. Unless it's what those ones that Lawrence was talking about, right? Or there's like yeah, there's like soda cichlids or the the ones that live in basically like sulfuric pools. Yeah. Well, the, was it <laughs> devil's devil's hole pupfish? Yeah, those guys run yeah. real hot, yeah. but you can't so, you can't get those guys. So there's so like 500 of them alive total. Unless you're keeping some of those or the Soda Spring ones or the the ones in you know yeah any of those, then yes, you're not <laughs> you're not gonna have a problem. Even if you had those, you're probably still gonna have a problem. Um, so yes, I would go back and do that Rainbird manifold system without a doubt. Somebody needs to make a video about it and start getting that around, and so you can say, hey, don't do that. Do this system. Well, I, I know this guy is looking for video advice. I think his name's Corey. Yeah. Uh, yeah you, so you, you, you really asked, you, you kind of like answered this question ahead of time, but maybe there's something we haven't covered. So I'll ask you this. What advice would you give a fish keeper looking to build their own fish room based on your experience and some of the things we've talked about? What, what would be the one, the one major thing that you're going to point to them and be like, this is the most important thing, period. Uh, I kind of like what Dean told me. I think I asked him that same question when I was interviewing him, and, and he said, you know, just getting started. Like, just start. Just start doing it. Um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in analysis paralysis that you can think about something and try to plan it out to perfection and, you know, never actually start executing. Um, but let's see, what would be the piece of advice – that I would give, it would probably be around that freaking rainbow manifold. Like if you're going to do auto water change, like just do that thing. Um, try and have as few PVC connections as possible. Um, you know, really, you know, really try and plan out as much as you can the uh, the tanks. Like hindsight being 2020, had I known that whole width thing, um, I would have uh, I would have you know, planned out my, my tanks a little bit differently. I wouldn't have bought six 40 breeders. I would have only have bought four 40 breeders instead of six, even though I did get them from a club member that was moving. So I got them for practically nothing. So that's not, you know, it wasn't a huge financial burden, but if you're paying even at the Petco sale price, like that, those are still, you know, decently expensive tanks to buy. Yep. Um, and then I don't know, maybe, maybe take a step back and be very retrospective and say, you know, obviously I have multiple tank syndrome. Obviously I have collectoritis. You know, is this space that I'm building going to satisfy what I want to do? Um, you know, if I was if I was a little bit more retrospective in that sense, and I had the foresight to actually plan out and know what I wanted to do, maybe I would have extended mine out by about three feet, one direction or another, or I just would have ran all the way lengthwise and taken over that whole side of the garage for the fish room and doubled my capacity basically. Um, I mean, because at that point, like, once you've already got the fixed costs, once you're already, like, 
in the process of doing it, like what's some extra two by fours to extend it out, right? Like what's, mm-hmm. you know, that, that extra sheet, um, sheet rock that you ended up throwing away, maybe that could have been the sheet rock that you used to, to actually, you know, finish the, the sheet rocking on that extension, um, of a slightly larger fish room. So, yeah, but who knows? I mean, maybe, maybe in the future, I just go ahead and take it over and build those walls out and punch a hole and we're good to go. Cool. So final question on this topic. Um, Let's say uh, something crazy happens. You have the ability to retire tomorrow. Lotto, pick your eccentric, crazy nonsense. Now that you've gone through this process, uh, aside from potentially just building that fish room a little larger, is there anything else about your fish room you would change? Yeah, I mean, it's got to be the length. I mean, or the size, right? Like, just make it bigger? I feel like I feel like just make it bigger. Um Acrylic tanks. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I <laughs> sure acrylic acrylic tanks. But I mean, if I, don't know, if I won the lottery, like, what do I care if they blow out? I don't know. I, I mean, pay somebody, <laughs> pay somebody to do it for me, and tell them exactly what I want, and, and do that. Um, so I would say, actually, what's what's very relevant now would be um, power. So we just had a major windstorm here in Western Washington. I lost power for about I don't know what. 10 hours, 12 hours, I think I, I lost power for. Um, Thankfully, no loss of fish. Yeah, yeah, no, no loss of fish. Um, I do have a generator for my house, so that's it, it by no means powers the whole house. So there's certainly some things that uh, that, that don't get powered. It's, it's a six-switch transfer, so I fire my generator up, and then I've got my six switches that I get to flip, and those circuits get powered. Um, one of those happens to be to one of the lines that goes into the fish room. Um, but then I also ha- can easily run an extension cord from my garage to an outlet that does get power into the fish room. And I did that to power my, my air pump. Uh, but I think, you know, if I had the resources, I would definitely make sure that I had, um, you know, a steady supply of power and heat during a power outage, right? Because we get power outages when, when it's cold. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to me, to me, supplying the air, that's the easy part. It's the heat. It's the heat, you know, I can, I can add on the, you know, the linear piston air pump onto my generator and not even, you know, the generator doesn't even know that it's there. But the moment you try to throw anything on that's going to heat, like that has any type of heat element, even when we turned our little, um, you know, hot water heater for like boiling water for tea, right? Like one of the little quick, quick, quick jobs, like you hear the generator actually like, oh man, you just fired up something pretty powerful. Like, no, it's just a small little thing. But anytime you do, you're heating with electricity, it takes a lot of power. Um, mm-hmm. So thankfully, we, we got the power on. I think my tanks dropped maybe six or seven degrees. Uh, maybe uh, the room dropped six or seven degrees. I think the tanks dropped like three or four. Um, yeah, the, so the I, water will hold yeah. heat for quite a while, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, but again, any longer than that, like what, what am I going to do? Um, so I think I would have, you know, I if I had the, the resources, I would definitely make sure that in those scenarios when the power goes out because we're super awesome and all of our power lines are hanging, they're not buried. And guess what? In Western Washington, we have a lot of trees and yeah. So and occasionally you, we get a lot of wind. Yeah. Yeah. We get some, some pretty nasty wind here. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I think that's something that I would definitely, even somebody outside of win the lotto, if you're going to build a fish room, you need to plan for the, what's going to happen when the power does go out in the winter time. How am I going to supply oxygen? How am I going to aerate the water? Um, how am how am I going to heat these tanks, right, for an extended period of time? I think that's a very, very, very important question to ask and a very important thing to solve. Um, and for me, it may be buying a second, you know, 2,000-watt generator just to run a space heater um, in that room. Cool. Cool. Well, Randy, thank you very much. Uh, we actually have another part, two that's going to come up where we're going to talk specifically toward your role with the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society, and that's talking about CARES. Um, but for this first part, thank you so much for going over your kind of trials and tribulations with the fish room and, and a little dive into who you are as a person. Uh, so as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and stay awesome.